Hi everyone, uh, welcome to part two of this tutorial. Uh, so in this part, uh, I, what I'm going to do is to uh, tell you a little bit about gradient descent algorithm for solving some of the non-convex problem. And in particular, we're going to use some simple examples to illustrate the so-called implicit regularization phenomenon. Okay, so uh, for concreteness, uh, what I'm going to do is to focus mostly uh, on a, a case study on a well-known problem called solving quadratic system of equations, and which actually is sufficient to review a lot of interesting phenomenon underlying non common statistical estimation. Okay, so what is the problem? So imagine that I have a vector x star of n dimension, and what I have collected is a collection of m random quadratic measurements about this unknown vector x star. My goal is to try to see whether it is possible to recover uh, the ground truth x star given this highly nonlinear system of equations. Without loss of generality, we're going to assume that this vector is uninorm, but it's not going to change any message that I'm going to uh, mention today. Why do we care about this problem? So originally the problem is perhaps best motivated by a problem in uh, optical imaging. So in optical imaging, uh, due to the kind of limitations of the optical detectors or sensors, it's often impossible to detect uh, or record the phases of, uh, of a light. So oftentimes what you're only able to measure is perhaps the intensity of the light. The intensity of the light uh, oftentimes can be viewed as some sort of quadratic measurements about uh, the unknown signal of interest. So this problem actually is also commonly referred to as phase retrieval. Uh, basically, it's about how to recover the signal if we only obtain intensity measurement, meaning that all the phases have not been observed. Moving beyond the physical sciences, uh, there's a recent line of work trying to argue that if you really want to care about some simple example of one layer neural net, uh, and then and if you do have certain kind of quadratic activation function, and learning the ways of this neural net can also be equivalently cast as solving uh, quadratic system of equations. As a result, uh, understanding how to solve this solving quadratic system of equations will have a lot to say about learning the simple model of neural nets. Equivalently, I would also like to argue that actually solving this problem also has a lot to do uh, with low rank factorization. So imagine that, recall that what we have uh, available is a collection of quadratic measurements uh, about x, all right. But if we introduce a larger dimensional matrix capital X in order to represent little x, little x transpose, and then the measurement yk, each of the measurement yk can equivalently be viewed as some linear measurements about this capital X matrix. So what this is saying is that quadratic measurements about the original unknown vector x is equivalent to linear measurements about this larger dimensional matrix. As a result, the problem of phase retrieval can actually be equivalently converted to uh, the problem of finding a rank one solution given a set of linear measurements. Okay, of course, we still have a rank constraint there. So the problem is still highly non convex but this provides an alternative uh, way to view this problem reviewing the intimate connection between solving quadratic system of equations and low rank matrix completion. All right, okay, so now, uh, so given that I have already motivated the problem, now let's try to take a look at how we are going to solve the problem. Okay, so a natural starting point is to resort to the so-called empirical risk minimization or certain kind of least square formulation. Recall that what we have in 10, it's a set of Y case, which are uh, quadratic measurements uh, about the unknown signal. 
So what we can do is perhaps to try to look at this non-converse formulation by minimizing the least square error, least square fitting error of any uh, candidate solution X. Okay, and the good thing is that it is well known that if you do have many, many samples, suppose that you have infinite samples and the problem, uh, if you are able to solve it, uh, you are going to uh, be able to recover exactly the ground truth. The bad thing, however, is that this objective function is highly non convex because it involves a degree four polynomial about X. So in general, it's computationally intractable to solve. All right, okay. So I'm um, motivated by this uh, non convex formulation about six years ago, uh, Emmanuel Candice group proposed a famous uh, algorithm called Wattinger flow in order to solve this problem. So the idea is very simple. Given that this is a non converse uh, formulation, what we are going to do is to split the algorithm into two stages. In the first stage, I'm going to find a smart initialization uh, to, to start this algorithm. So I'm not going to start it with uh, some arbitrary initialization, but actually some careful one. And this turns out to be doable uh, using a PCA type of uh, algorithm called spectral method. After this uh, suitable initialization is obtained, uh, uh, Candice Lee and Sotono Kataby Proposed to run some version of the gradient descent algorithm until it converges. Okay, here I'm going to choose ADA, the step size, to be careful enough uh, so as to make sure that it converges. Okay, so this is a very, very simple two stage algorithm, but it actually turns out to enjoy a very nice theoretical guarantees. All right, okay, so now let me try to explain a little bit about. Uh, why we are going to do these two stage out. So first of all, uh, the, the, regarding the initialization, uh, the a more concrete procedure looks like the following. So we are going to first form this large matrix capital Y using the data samples I have. Uh, after I form this matrix, I'm going to compute the leading eigenvector of this matrix. So the rationale of this algorithm is very simple because if I, for example, if you consider the population level case where I have infinite number of samples, and then you can show that, oh, you, you know, like why it's going to converge is mean, which after a little bit of calculation, you can show that it's mean is equal to uh, the quantity that I list here, okay? So if it's very easy to see that except for an I scale identity part, the rest of the components is a rank one component, which is proportional to X star times X star transpose. As a result, this basically means that if you are able to look at the leading eigenvector of this mean matrix, then its leading eigenvector is precisely equal to either X star or minus X star. Okay, now the question, uh, for example, uh, is whether uh, in a finite sample case, this still is a good enough solution. Uh, it turns out that you can use some high dimensional statistics tools to show that actually the answer is yes. Okay, so the rationale of the two stage approach now can be made uh, somewhat clear now. First of all, I'm going to use uh, the uh, uh, spectral method to find a reasonable solution. At the very least, if I do have so many, many uh, samples, I can guarantee that my initialization uh, is supposed to be not too far away from the ground truth solution, okay? Now, the second step basically boils down to certain kind of successive refinement. And the rationale is very simple. Even though the, the objective function in general is highly non-convex, but if we are able to focus attention on a local region surrounding the ground truth, then maybe the functional optimization landscape, even though it might still be highly non-convex, it might not be that bad. Maybe 
if we're fortunate enough, maybe there's only a single uh, uh, stationary point within this local region. If this is the case, and then if you are able to run an algorithm carefully to find this stationary point, and then it means that you can find the global solution. Right. Okay, so this is a very simple two-stage strategy, and it actually finds a lot of applications in a lot in problems well beyond phase retrieval. And it has received a lot of attention in the research community in the last several years. Okay, and based on this very simple idea, and even in the original paper by Candice Lee and Sotano Academy, they have developed very interesting uh, theoretical guarantees to support the use of this so-called Wertinger flow algorithm. Okay, so let's take a look, quick look uh, at what they have developed in their first paper. So suppose that your step size is taken to be something smaller than one over N, it's positive learning rate, but smaller than one over N. Then what they are able to show is that if the sample size is larger than otherwise larger than N times log N, and then uh, if you look at certain kind of distance metric, which I listed here, which is some sort of, you know, uh, like a L2 distance modulo some global sign. And then if you look at this uh, distance metric, it converges geometrically fast to zero. Okay, so this is a very intriguing thing. It, rec uh, it reveals the linear convergence property about this output. All right, okay, so now let's try to interpret this a little bit uh, in terms of the computational complexity and the sample complexity. Iteration complexity, uh, recall that the contraction factor here is one minus eta over four, and eta is, requ is required to be smaller than one over n, all right? And these two facts put together, you, it's very easy for us to show that the total number of iterations needed in order to achieve epsilon accuracy is no more than n times log one over epsilon. All right, and the sample complexity is another thing that we have already talked about, so which only needs to be a little bit larger than the total number of unknowns. Okay, so this already is a very intriguing starting point for us. And I would like to comment that how do we, how do we end up with this theorem? Uh, basically, this is by based on some worst case uh, convex analysis taken together certain kind of uh, uh, non-asymptotic random matrix field. And then you can actually end up with this kind of field. Now the question, okay, is that if we examine this theorem, the good thing is that this is a polynomial time algorithm. The bad thing, however, is that uh, the iteration complexity might actually still be somewhat large, right? This is not a, a, a dimension-free kind of iteration complexity. Actually, it scales with the problem dimension. So maybe in practice, it's still a little large if you really want to deal with large-scale problems. Fortunately, uh, in our recent work, actually, we are able to show that uh, it turns out that the step size can be actually taken to be much more aggressive to be at well, the level of one over log n, which actually in turn allows us to improve the iteration complexity to log n of times log one over epsilon. So it's a significant improvement uh, upon the original field. And we're going to spend a little bit of time discussing this and about how we are able to, why we're able to improve the theory uh, which turns out to require some very fine grain analysis of gradient descent trajectory. Okay, so let's try to start from the optimization point of view. And if you give this problem to optimization people, what are they going to say? Okay, so here, again, just to remind you about our assumptions, how we have this Gaussian design assumption. And uh, if you go to the optimization people, uh, they are going to ask you, at least for the local, uh, analysis, they are going to ask you what kind of geometric properties you are going to have for this problem. So let's try to analyze something uh, of particular interest to optimization people. First of all, for this very uh, simple uh, non-convex problem, 
it turns out that if you're sufficiently close to the ground truth, is one very nice thing happening is actually the, the Hessian of the objective function turns out to be a positive definite, meaning that this actually is locally strongly convex. The bad thing, however, is that even though this is a strongly convex problem, it turns out to be very ill condition. The condition number for this particular problem actually scales with n, even locally. And this is a bad message. If you still know what is a gradient descent theory, gradient descent theory basically says that if you run gradient descent, the total number of iterations needed is going to scale with linearly with the condition number, which actually leads up to Candice result, which says that total number of iteration for this case needs to be n times log one of epsilon. Now, what's wrong with this? Okay, and whether it is way, which what is the place that I can we can actually improve it? Okay, so let's try to uh, look at take a closer look inspection into this problem. Okay, first of all, the conclusion that which says the algorithm converges in n iterations is based on the following crucial assumption: the step size now is taken to be uh, one over n or some, something smaller than that. And why do we have this choice? This particular choice is precisely suggested by the so-called generic optimization theory, because it's chosen based on the condition number or more, more precisely, uh, the smoothness parameter of this problem. The question, however, is that since this is based on worst case optimization theory, the question is that does it really capture what happens in practice? Now to illustrate this, uh, let's try to first collect some numerical uh, uh, evidence. All right. So here I'm going to run some numerical uh, uh, experiments. I'm going to vary the dimension of the problem n from 20 to 1000. I'm going to plot the relative L2 error as a function of the iteration count. Okay, so here the y-axis is plotted in a logarithmic scale. So if you see a straight line here, it basically means that we have linear convergence. Here, I'm actually taking, for all the experiments here, I'm taking the step size to be 0.1, okay, regardless of the dimension of the problem. Now, if you look at all the numerical plots, you see that for all the problem, the algorithm, the behavior of the algorithm is roughly the same, except for the case where this is uh, n equal to 20, uh, but once n exceeds 100, the behavior is roughly the same. So numerical experiments somehow suggest that maybe the algorithm actually converges quite fast, even when a constant step size is employed. Okay, so now then what's wrong? Why comparing this with the worst case optimization theory, uh, we can perhaps try to take a closer look to see uh, why the generic theory is somewhat pessimistic. Okay, so let's try to take a look at the, uh, uh, the gradient descent uh, theory again. Okay, and what we're going to do again is to try to take a look at the Hessian of the problem. So it turns out that this is the Hessian expression that I can easily compute. It, can, it consists of two components. It consists of two components. Now let's try to focus on the first component. The first component actually is precisely where the issue arises. If your X point is too much aligned with AK, then this is going to give you a very, very large number. If this number is very, very large in optimization language, this means that the problem actually might not be very smooth. Okay, it's smooth, but it might have a very large smoothness parameter. Okay, and if you have very large smoothness parameter, this is not usually not an encouraging thing. So the key thing based on this analysis is to show that maybe we want to make sure that we are focusing on the kind of uh, candidate solution X that's not too aligned with the sampling vector. Okay, so here, Maybe I can plot something here. Uh, actually, if you look at uh, 
if you want to examine which region enjoys a uh, strong convexity and uh, smoothness, this is maybe what we can do. If we focus only on the set of uh, uh, points, they are almost almost orthogonal to each of the design vector AK. And it turns out that uh, the optimization landscape is actually much better. So for example, if I only focus on the region almost orthogonal to A1, this is going to give me the strip. Uh, if I also plot the, the region almost orthogonal to A2, this is going to give me another strip. So eventually this is going to give me uh, a polyhedron. Okay, so which is like the graded, uh, shady area here. So if we are able, this basically means that, okay, if we are able to make sure our iterates always fall within this shady region, and then the region actually, because it enjoys strong convexity and smoothness is well conditioned, and then maybe the, the algorithm can perform much better. In fact, a lot of prior work basically suggest using some kind of regularization procedures in order to make sure that you are falling within this region. Uh, it turns out that if you are able to use uh, some careful statistical analysis, actually you are able to show that throughout the entire uh, trajectory of the, the gradient descent algorithm, it enjoys certain kind of implicit regularization uh, phenomenon in the sense that gradient descent is implicitly regularized so as to make sure that you always force within this nice region. So it never leaves, this, even though this is not a unit, like a ball shape kind of uh, region, you never actually jump out of it. And this is a very, very intriguing thing, even though this is can be derived from gen gen generic optimization theory, but this actually enjoys some very fine grained statistical properties about the gradient descent trajectory, which in turn actually allows us to obtain much better theory. Okay, so this is the final uh, theorem that we have, just to remind you. First of all, we are able to show that for every single point in the trajectory, uh, it is almost orthogonal to any of the design vector AK. So this is a so-called incoherence property that we are uh, for specific to this problem. And then we have linear convergence, even when the step size is almost like a constant one. So putting everything together, we are able to guarantee that the algorithm guarantees, attains epsilon accuracy within roughly a logarithmic number of iterations. Okay, so now the question is, uh, what is the key idea underlying the proof of this thing? Uh, in the interest of time, I'm definitely won't be able to, uh, I definitely won't be able to go into the details of the proofs. But I can give you some keywords that you might find useful if eventually you want to look into this literature. So there is a very powerful idea called leave one out analysis, deeply rooted in the probability and random matrix literature that turns out to be very useful. The idea is very simple. Uh, I'm going to, because I want to sort of like decouple the dependency between my iterate and each of the design vector, Every time what I'm going to do is say, uh, will I look at one sampling vector? Okay, I'm going to drop it and then rerun the entire algorithm. Very simple. I just drop one sample and rerun the entire algorithm. Why do I want to do this? Because I drop this sampling vector, let's call it AL. Because I have dropped this sample, so it's the algorithm has never seen it, so it's going to be independent from this sample. Okay, so because of the independent thing, we know that the trajectory is going to be almost orthogonal to this, this vector because it has never seen this vector. Another thing is that because I have a lot of uh, samples, but I only, only drop one of them. So you are from some stability argument, you are going to expect that your trajectory is going to be quite close to uh, uh, the original trajectory. Putting these two things together, you can propagate uh, the nice near orthogonality property about the Lieberman or its rate to the original iterate. 
And this is going to be the way that we justify uh, this incoherence consumption. Okay, again, okay. uh, if you're interested in this, maybe take a look at our paper, uh, which actually the analysis is, uh, even though this is based on this very simple idea, fleshing out the, the idea requires quite a bit of uh, efforts. Okay, so uh, before I move on, I also want to mention one more uh, message that turns out to be quite useful. So there are quite a lot of prior work, uh, which try to, because of the mathematical difficulty, they suggest that maybe we can use fresh samples at every iteration when you run grade in descent. Uh, the main purpose is to decouple statistical dependence. However, if you are really dealing with sample startup applications like phase retrieval, splitting the samples might not be practical at all uh, in, in practice. Uh, but, but the analysis that I just illustrate actually allows us to show that even when you are reusing all the samples in every iteration, the same phenomenon happen and you, the algorithm still converges uh, geometrically fast to the right solution. All right, okay, so uh, this, is the, this is the first example uh, that I can go to. Uh, and then I'm, I'm also going to spend a little bit of the time expanding it to tell you that actually uh, the same message actually carry out, carry over to other problems as well. Okay, so the next problem I'm going to briefly mention uh, is the so-called uh, low ram matrix uh, uh, completion problem. So what is this problem? Perhaps uh, many of you already heard of this problem. The, uh, the setting is very simple. Suppose that I have a large low ram matrix uh, suppose that what I have observed is some highly incomplete observations about its entries. Suppose that I have a sampling set omega uh, that I only get to see an entry uh, of M when the, the location lies within the sampling set. Okay, the goal is to see whether it is possible for us to reconstruct the original matrix even though we only have uh, incomplete data about this matrix. Okay, throughout this talk, we are going to assume, make some assumptions about the sampling set. We are going to consider random sampling so such that each entry is observed independently with probability P. Okay, so this problem actually shares quite a bit of the similarity with the low rank, uh, with the, the phase retrieval problem I had just mentioned but it turns out to be even harder. In phase retrieval, we mentioned that for natural non converse formulation, strong conversity actually holds, but the, even though this is not uh, uh, smooth enough. For this matrix completion problem, actually, if you look at the most natural least square formulation, strong conversity actually does not hold. And smoothness also is problematic. It's, and all of this actually might result in uh, an infinitely large condition number, which is not something desirable for optimization literature. And because of this, a lot of the prior work actually suggests that maybe you can try to change the loss function by adding extra regularization term in order to help in promote the incoherent, certain kind of incoherent uh, condition. And what we are going to show you instead is actually that all of this is not necessary. Okay, so uh, before I move on, let me try to quickly remind you about what is the incoherence condition for matrix completion. So the standard matrix incoherence condition is defined as follows. You imagine that I have a low rank, uh, rank R matrix M. Suppose that this is a symmetric matrix and with eigen decomposition U times sigma times U transpose. And then this uh, matrix is said to be mu incoherent if this condition is satisfied. So I'm going to impose a condition on the two to infinity norm of the singular, uh, the eigen matrix U. I want to make sure that this two to infinity norm is sufficiently small and smaller than equal to this guy. So if mu is quite small, 
this basically means that the energy of this U matrix is sort of like more or less spread out across all of its rows. Okay, so this is the incoherence condition we have for the matrix completion problem. Okay, so now coming back to the non conference optimization. So in non conference optimization, the natural starting point is to run gradient descent as usual. And the way we do it is perhaps to look at uh, the, this, uh, uh, this solution, you know, like subject to the low rank constraint. So we are sort of like minimizing the, uh, the estimation error subject to this low rank condition. Okay, and this, this rank R uh, condition turns out to be not that easy to uh, exploit. So an alternative way to do so is to try to factorize M, our, our decision matrix M hat in the very concrete rank R form. So what we are going to do is to actually reparameterize M hat, if this is a positive sum definite case, we're going to reparameterize it into XX transpose. And it turns out that if we do it this way, now we are able to remove this constraint, rank, uh, rank R constraint and give a, a, and a, a arrive at the cleaner objective function. So uh, of course, if you look at this problem, uh, this formulation is highly non convex So this, which gives rise to a lot of computational complexity in solving this. All right, okay, so now how to do this? Okay, so now there's a natural algorithm that you can, that can come into your mind in solving this non-converse formulation. Motivated by the success of Wettinger flow, uh, we might start by suggesting some uh, spectral method in order for us to obtain initialization. And after this, uh, okay, after we obtain this uh, low rank factor estimate x naught, we're going to run gradient descent until it converges. So in general, a very, very simple two-stage paradigm, similar to the low rank, uh, the phase retrieval problem. Okay, so we also have very nice theory uh, about this gradient descent algorithm. Uh, but in order to do so, in order to present to you our theoretical guarantees, I need a little bit more uh, definition, which is crucial for this. So in matrix completion problem, there is sometimes a rotational issues there, rotational ambiguity issue there. Meaning that if you have uh, obtained the uh, low rank factor, oftentimes if you rotate this low rank factor, uh, you will result in the same matrix. So this means that there is some ambiguity that you want to take care of in order to better state your results. So in this, uh, because of this, we're going to introduce the following matrix that help us uh, present the theory. Suppose I give you my current estimate xt, and suppose that you want to compare this with the ground truth x star, okay? And I'm going to generate XQT as the matrix that best aligns xt with x star. It's an awful normal matrix, uh, but it serves the purpose of aligning these two matrices to the best uh, possible way. With this, I can present you uh, with you our theorem. Suppose that uh, my ground truth matrix is low rank, it's positive, some definite, it's incoherent, it's well conditioned. Then if you just run the two stage algorithm that I have presented, it actually achieves the following linear convergence property. Okay, so I have three bullets here. Each of the bullets corresponds to one performance metric. So I have, we have looked at the Frobenius norm error. We have looked at the spectral norm error and also two to infinity norm error. All of them converge geometrically fast to zero. 
So this is a very intriguing thing. It says that actually, if you run this algorithm, uh, you can sort of like, first of all, you know that the Euclidean error converges fast. And not only the Euclidean error, every single row of this low rank factor estimates actually converges roughly at the same speed to zero. So the error estimation error is sort of like uh, spread out across all of the rows. This is a very intriguing message that cannot be obtained by generic optimization here. And this actually also is con consistent with numerical evidence. For example, in this plot, I'm plotting the numerical error of my algorithm as the uh, iteration count. And I'm plotting the error measured in different metrics, Frobenius norm, infinity norm, a spectral norm, and you can see that indeed, all of these norms, uh, the algorithm, the estimation error uh, converges geometrically fast. And all this is achieved when the step size is taken to be a constant uh, equal to 0.2. Okay, so uh, again, I won't have time to go over the theory and the theory is again, based on the Lee one of the coupling idea that I have mentioned. But let me just quickly go over uh, some of the other alternative approach uh, for doing this uh, that have been proposed in the literature. In the literature, uh, instead of exploiting this uh, very uh, careful but powerful statistical idea, there are other approaches that you can use to help promote the so-called incoherence. For example, you can change the objective function by adding regularization. You can do some proper projection to each iterate. You project your iterate onto a certain kind of incoherence set. Uh, all of these are valid choices, but what we are actually able to show using the Lee one idea is that probably none of these steps are actually necessary. Uh, maybe they are introduced mostly for you to simplify analysis from the practical point of view. Uh, maybe uh, the algorithm automatically enforces this kind of regularization, thus achieving the best performance as possible. It has also found other applications in quadratic sampling, which I'm going to skip in the interest of time. Finally, in the last several minutes, I'm going to also talk a little bit about the necessity of careful initialization. So just to remind you, okay, so now I'm going to plot the optimization landscape in this two dimensional plot for the phase retrieval problem. Uh, let me just give you some illustration about the importance of initialization. So this problem, if you look at the level set, this is clearly a non-convex problem. Uh, but if uh, why do we want to do spectral initialization? Because spectral initialization allows us to start with some point where the local optimization landscape turns out to be convex. So things could be better if we start in this way. Now the question is that, is this crucial for achieving fast convergence? The answer, okay, first of all, I, I, we definitely know that we won't be able to just initialize it arbitrarily uh, because for example, if you happen to hit some of the uh, saddle points, gradient descent is not going to be able to jump out of the saddle points region. You might get stuck there. Unless you use smarter way to get uh, away from these saddle points, you might just get stuck. So you do need to make sure that you don't hit the saddle point. However, if this is the only thing that we need to do, then it's going to be very easy because you can just start randomly and with probability zero, you are going to hit the saddle point. So now the question is that if you start the algorithm randomly, which is actually a simpler and more model agnostic approach in practice, how does it perform? Is it possible to converge in a reasonable way? Now to, to answer this question, uh, let's again, start with the numerical uh, efficiency. So if we look at this, uh, so I'm, again, I'm plotting the algorithm, the L2 error of the, the iterates as a function of the iteration count. 
And you can see that. And this is starting with a random initialization. You can see that in the first several iterations, like the first 30 iterations, uh, gradient descent. Actually, it's slowly improving the performance. It doesn't improve fast, but it is slowly improving. Uh, but after, let's say, 30 iterations, we sort of like enter the linear convergence phase for in which the algorithm converge fairly fast. So the, the key message putting these two messages together is actually in general, in total still, the algorithm converges maybe within you know, several hundreds of iterations, regardless of the dimension of the problem. So this seems like a very intriguing message. Now let's try, let's try to take a look at what are the possible ways in analyzing this. So first of all, uh, there is a geometric perspective look, that look into this problem. So about four years ago in John Rice group, uh, they, have, they have this very intriguing finding saying that if the sample size is sufficiently large, uh, you, we can guarantee that there's no spurious local minimum. There might be saddle points and fortunately all the saddle points are strict in the sense that you can, you, all of them are associated with some sufficiently negative eigenvalues. Meaning that it's not that difficult to escape such uh, saddle point. However, and with this uh, nice landscape analysis and uh, a work by uh, my colleague, Jason Lee and his co-authors, and they are able to show that gradient descent with random initialization uh, is going to converge to the global solution almost surely. The issue, however, is that there's no convergence guarantee that has been provided. And in fact, uh, there are some examples where gradient descent with random initialization might take uh, exponential time to converge. Okay, so now in order to better understand this, uh, let's try to, I'm going to give you another plot that help us better understand what's happening in the first stage. This is the L2 error that you already seen but it's difficult to understand the first 30 uh, iterations. So let me plot, give you another plot. In this plot, I'm plotting the correlation between my current iterate and uh, the, the ground truth solution. Now you can see that uh, this correlation in the first several iterations blows up exponentially fast. Okay, so putting these two messages together, you see that in the first stage, something is changing exponentially fast. The second stage, something is converging linear. So both of the cases are corresponds to fast converging dynamics. So it seems that the numerical uh, evidence suggests that maybe it only takes a few, quite a, only a few iterations for the algorithm to converge. And in fact, this is something that we can justify using our fear. So our theorem says that if you do have guide Gaussian design, if you randomly initialize your algorithm, and we can guarantee that actually uh, it converges fast. Okay, so this still looks like a complicated theorem, but let me try to break it down into multiple parts to better and help you better understand. First of all, the theorem says that in the first stage, it only takes us about log n iterations to reach uh, uh, an estimation error, not larger than gamma. Gamma is something like 0.1. Okay, so it's a fixed constant and it only takes you log n iterations. In the second stage, uh, we have linear convergence, similar to what we have uh, analyzed for the spectrally initialized working flow out. So these two things put together, we can guarantee that even you are randomly initializing the algorithm, in total, it takes you about log, log, uh, log n plus log one over epsilon iterations to reach epsilon accurate. So it's supposed to be something very fast. And all of this happens as long as your sample size is a little above the information theoretical limit. Okay, so uh, before I end this part, I also want to quickly comment on another line of work called saddle escaping algorithm that have been very popular. Uh, in the last uh, several years. Uh, if you are familiar with this literature, you might naturally ask, 
how come that you don't really need to introduce any kind of subtle escaping schemes in order to get away from the subtle points? Here, I'm plotting the typical dynamics of the problem uh, in this two-dimensional plot, where actually these two block points correspond to the subtle point. So this is a GD trajectory, and you can see that actually the trajectory actually never get too close to the subtle point. Whenever it's getting closer to the subtle point, there is sort of like a force forcing it uh, to be stay away from the subtle point. So since you are never really too close to the subtle point, so that's why there is actually no need to even try to escape. It. And this actually is a phenomenon that you can only see by using careful statistical analysis. Uh, in fact, if you just compare our fine grain analysis with what, uh, another available theory, general theory for the subtle escaping schemes, you can see that all of the prior work uh, can only guarantee polynomial convergence, uh, polynomially large number of iterations in solving this phase retrieval problem. But if you are able to do the statistical analysis carefully, even vanilla gradient descent with random initialization converges within a logarithmic number of iteration. Again, all of this suggests that generic, generic optimization theory might be too conservative and we do need some careful statistical analysis to understand it. All right, okay, that's all for this part. Uh, thank you for your attention.